It's Three's company in a rebuilt safety group for the Seahawks. We'll be diving into the latest edition, Kayvon Wallace, joining the roster here on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined here on our Wednesday episode by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and a special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening in nearby Lacey, Washington, or over in Buffalo, New York, and Bill's country. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week free agency isn't over and yet it kind of feels like it is for the Seahawks so we're going to start our latest roster reset on the defensive side of the football looking at where things stand on the Seahawks depth chart and Mike debate of locked on Patriots will be joining us to break down Farrell Brown the new tight end edition for the Seahawks it's a jam-packed episode brought your way by FanDuel make every moment more right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning five dollar bet that's 200 bucks if your bet wins visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started now for your lead story here on our wednesday edition of locked on seahawks earlier this month one of the major sets of moves the seahawks had to set in motion to open up cap space they released quandre Diggs and jamal adams two of their highest priced players and now they have a new trifecta at the safety position. Julian Love being the only returning player from last year's trio. They signed Rayshon Jenkins for Jaguar last week. And now you can add a new player to the mix. And Kayvon Wallace, who previously played for the Eagles, as well as last season, the Cardinals and the Titans. One of the three new additions this week in free agency. And Rob, I was really fascinated by this signing, and I know that a lot of fans are going to look at the fact that Wallace played for two teams last year, and he was released by two teams. The Eagles cut him at the end of training camp in August. He was cut by the Cardinals when Buda Baker returned from injured reserve, ironically, just in time to play the Seahawks in Seattle. So he bounced around quite a bit last year, and yet this is a player who's only 26 years old, and offers a ton of versatility. And when you look at the numbers and watch the film last year, it's kind of hard to figure out why he couldn't find a place to stick. Yeah, he's a really interesting player. And uh, I applaud the Seahawks for for making this move. I think it just, you used the word versatile. And I think that that is the perfect word to describe not only Kayvon Wallace and what he is able to provide from an individual perspective, but I think that it also makes the Seahawks defense more versatile. I mean, how ironic would it be after all of these years of Pete Carroll preaching the possibility of using three safeties that maybe it's Mike McDonald actually, who is going to wind up using a three safety look more often than, than Carroll did with his version of the Seahawks. Cable Wallace is a guy that, uh, you know, has an awful lot of snaps at that free safety position, as well as strong safety, even dropped down and play the nickel cornerback spot as well. And again, that matches up very nicely with what the CX already have with Rayshon Jenkins as well as Julian Love. And to me, it just makes the CX that much more multiple, that much more able to match up against tight ends, like say a George Kittle or wide receivers, let's say a Debo Samuel, for example. And again, not lose much if one player goes down to injury. That was always one of the concerns I had uh, in the past with the Seahawks is that you had a classic free safety in Quandre Diggs. You had a classic strong safety in Jamal Adams. But if either one of them went down <clears throat> the way that Jamal Adams did year after year, then you were really were kind of stuck. I mean, we saw the Seahawks basically bring Julian Love in and kind of try to make him a, a little bit of a round hole in a square peg kind of a thing, not really taking advantage of what makes him such a gifted player. Uh, that to me is one of the things I'm excited about here with the addition of Kayvon Wallace is he does have the ability to play multiple different roles and that allows the Seahawks to be that much more creative that much more uh kind of impervious to injury 
Yeah, I think the thing that I really like about this trio of safeties the Seahawks have assembled, first, it's a much cheaper group than the one sure. that they've had <laughs> the last couple of years. And, and that was something that needed to be done. They had way too much money invested in that position for what they were receiving back production-wise, particularly. And I know injuries were a big part of it, but Jamal Adams, it just didn't work out. And so you've got a cheaper group, but you also have a more flexible group. All three of these safeties can play both safety positions and they all can play in the slot if you need them to as a big nickel all three of these guys are capable of doing that and Mike McDonald if you watch the Ravens Seahawks game you you don't need to watch the rest of their games to know this just watch the game against the Seahawks when they thumped them in Baltimore Mike McDonald loves to do pre-snap disguises and give different looks and it's a lot harder to do that when you have a free safety that doesn't necessarily have the flexibility to play in the box, or you have a strong safety that doesn't have the flexibility to drop back as a free safety. All three of these guys can do both of those positions. And so Mike McDonald should be able to do those pre-snap disguises and mix these guys around as interchangeable parts. And he used a lot of three safety sets in Baltimore. He's not going to have the same types of players necessarily, but he'll still be able to run a lot of those sub packages with this team. And you just look at the numbers. This is kind of season that Kayvon Wallace had last year, Rob. He actually finished, even though he was with two different teams, he finished 25th among corners or among safeties in solo tackles. He finished 13th in pass breakups, just behind Rayshon Jenkins, who played the entire season in Jacksonville. And he also had the 29th best coverage grade, 70.7 from Pro Football Focus, a near even 50-50 split, free safety, strong safety. Jenkins played a lot of free safety too, leaned a little more heavily towards that box strong safety position. But Kayvon Wallace had a really solid season last year, despite the fact that it seemed like nobody wanted to keep him. He had a pass breakup on nearly 15% of the targets thrown his direction last year from quarterbacks. And he had an interception on top of that. If you add the interception in more than 15% of the passes thrown at him, he got his hands on it for either an interception or a pass breakup. So there's clearly ball skills here. I think that's where he's at his best. When I'm looking at these three players, Wallace has missed some tackles when he's been asked to play up in the box and he's a little bit light to do that consistently, but he has enough flexibility. You can play him there some. I look at him as being more of a free safety than a strong safety, whereas Jenkins, after revisiting the film, feel like he's more of a strong than a free safety. And Julian Love of these three is probably the one player I would say, I'm not sure if there's necessarily a spot that he's better at because he's really solid at both. But I like the flexibility this move gives you. And he's a young player that could maybe play his way into another contract too. Because again, he's only 26. There's been flashes of him being really solid, but there hasn't been consistency with how teams have used him to this point. Yeah, and I think that you did a nice job of kind of articulating the relative strengths and weaknesses of, of all three uh, of Seattle's uh, safeties that have starting experience. Uh, and again, we've talked a little bit about some of the other players um, that, that Seattle has on their depth chart, and we're getting into that a little bit deeper um, a little bit later in today's show. But uh, as you said, uh, Kayvon Wallace, and you just look at his size, I think that he does project a little bit better than that more of the traditional free safety, and he's got the range to be able to handle that. Um, those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can see the different statistics that are up here, but those of you who are not watching on YouTube, then, hey, jump on board. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to kind of mention a little of the numbers that uh, that Corbin has up here. For one, the pass rate uh, of Wallace, 92.4 percent um, compared to the 72 percent for Jenkins but the touchdowns allowed just one touchdown allowed by either of these players a year ago I, I watched the touchdown that came on Wallace gave up it was to the tight end Evan Ingram ironically enough other Jacksonville Jaguars um, with, with Trevor Lawrence at the quarterback position it was just a beautifully thrown ball um, very good timing with the tight end Evan Ingram hey the, even all pros are going to beat sometimes I also watched the interception that he recorded and that was against Joe Burrow of the Cincinnati Bengals so again these are number one overall quarterbacks that uh that, that Kayvon Wallace was going up against so 
while he was released by the two different clubs, as you mentioned, the Arizona Cardinals and the Tennessee Titans, it's not like this was a guy who was on the back end of the roster. Just, just watching him and going back to his Clemson tape and the schedule but about him, David Wallace is a guy who is a little bit of a smack talker, a, a little bit of a look-at-me kind of a guy. And frankly, I think that that's something that the Seahawks need on, on defense right now. I would argue that their best player on the entire defense is Devin Witherspoon, and he's a little bit of a smack talker as well. When you lose a guy, the leadership ability of a Quandre Diggs or just the flash and style of Jamal Adams, you've got to be able to add somebody who's got some of that. So I think this is a nice fit, not only from a X's and O's kind of a standpoint. I think from just a personality standpoint, the Seahawks needed somebody who was going to bring a little bit of that juice and Kayvon Wallace can provide that. Yeah, this guy's feisty. And you can just tell if you were looking at the Seahawks website today, his massive smile that he had signing his contract. I mean, he took that at another level. That's the way that this guy plays the game. So I like the fit. Don't view him as a starter, but this guy's a really good sub package player. And Mike McDonald loves to mix in multiple safety looks, three safety looks when they're in dime. The Ravens actually had a few times they played four safeties. So they like to mix in a lot of DBs with different sub packages. And this is a guy that gives you enough positional flexibility and ball skills that I think he's going to get quite a few snaps on the defensive side of the football. Up next, we're going to shift over to the offense. Another one of Seattle's free agent signings. He came from the Pacific Northwest originally at Oregon. What does tight end Farrell Brown bring to Seattle's offense in a revamped tight end group? We're going to be chatting with Mike DeBate of Locked On Patriots. That's coming up next year on our Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time of your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need and all the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back to the Wednesday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined here on our latest episode by Mike DeBate of Locked on Patriots. And we're going to be diving into Pharaoh Brown's addition to the Seattle Seahawks tight end room. And Mike, as always, greatly appreciate having the best to share your insight. Oh, anytime, Corbin. Thanks so much for having me. You do great work here on Locked on Seahawks. It really is uh, an honor to be a part of this team and everything we do here together on Locked On. And uh, give me an opportunity to talk about Pharaoh Brown. I'm always willing to do that. Happy to do it. <laughs> this is an interesting story because obviously last year was a very down season in New England. It led to the departure of Bill Belichick. That's how bad things went last year. Mm. But one of the few bright spots, I think I'm I think I'm in accurate uh, terms there saying that Farrell Brown was a bright spot because top 10 ranked run blocker for the uh, Patriots, according to Pro Football Focus, averaged 16 yards of reception. So mm -hmm. take me through that. This had to be one of those under the radar signings that ended up being much bigger than anticipated or at least paying bigger dividends than anticipated. Yeah, when Farrell came in last year, Corbin, there was a buzz, an undercurrent of excitement that came along with it because he had been someone that Bill Belichick had talked about in press conferences as the type of tight end he would love to see in his system. And then to be able to bring him in on a deal that really started off as a practice squad deal and then Farrell eventually was signed to the 53-man roster, I think a lot of people started to pay attention and really take note as to what this guy could do. And pairing him alongside someone like Hunter Henry, who, believe it or not, Farrow was actually even more productive at the first stages of the season than Mike Gusecki, who was a much more high-profile, high-priced free agent that the Patriots had brought in. Farrow had become that niche weapon, someone that could really break for the big play, but also provide you a tremendous amount of value as an inline blocker. And for Seattle, I think that's where he's going to be at his best. But heading into the month of November, you mentioned the 16 yards. 
Heading into November, he was actually averaging 24.3 yards per reception. Pro Football Focus graded him at a 92.8 heading into the middle part of that month. So it gives you an example as to what this guy can do with the ball in his hands. And when he's used to getting those opportunities to make big plays, Farrell Brown can make them. I want to shift focus to the blocking first because that's really what John Schneider was pointing out on Seattle Sports 710 last week, talking about the different signings Seattle's had. And he described him as a nasty tone setter and an old soul. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on those characterizations. Would you agree with that? And what would be your way of summarizing his play style as a run blocker? Yeah, 100%. I think that's an accurate assessment. I've always described Farrow as a offensive lineman in a tight end setting. And I think that that's something that he's going to bring to this uh, team. And I think that's something that he's going to bring to the Seahawks offense in 2024. He's definitely someone that can anchor well. He's built low to the gray. He's built very well in the lower part of his body, but he's got excellent hand placement as well. And that's something that is not always um, akin to a tight end getting out there and to be an inline blocker, someone that can really be an impactful player in the run blocking game. Farrell Brown absolutely has that. Ramondre Stevenson, Ezekiel Elliott, when both healthy, obviously, were able to find seams more often than not because of the influence and because of the impact of Farrell Brown being able to assist that offensive line in run blocking. So, yeah, he's got a little bit of a nasty edge to him. I think Seahawks fans are going to like that. I think opposing teams will not, <laughs> and that's a good thing for the Seahawks. But at the same time, you're going to get a guy that knows where he needs to be and instinctively is always in the right place at the right time. That's not by happenstance, folks. That's by design. That's exactly what Farrell Brown loves to do. This guy is as good as it gets for a blocking tight end, especially someone that you're counting on, like Schneider said, to be a part of that offense and help facilitate it. When you look at him physically, you don't see a physical run blocker because mm -hmm. he's he's tall and kind of lean. You wouldn't anticipate that that's going to be the play style. And then you turn on the film and you're like, my goodness, look mm -hmm. at him knock that guy off the ball. But when you look at him physically, you would think that he would be a weapon in the passing game. He hasn't hit 70 receptions in his career. That has not been a big focal point for him, even as a starter with the Texans and last year starting 11 games for the Patriots. But as you said – at the midway point of the season, a little after midway point of the season, he was averaging more than 23 yards per reception. So there's a very limited sample size, and yet at the same time, this feels like a guy that could be a complimentary weapon with Noah Fant, who's also a really athletic tight end, that he could be a complimentary guy that could do some damage in the passing game. How would you describe his passing game, his receiving talents, in terms of his ability to rack up that yardage? Is he a guy that's going to be able to win – with vertical uh, th vertical routes, or is he a guy that's going to create more after the catch? He can actually do both, believe it or not. I think he's probably going to be more of a weapon in the vertical game. Any Seahawks fan that's wondering what Farrell Brown can bring you as a receiver, I encourage you to take a look at the Patriots' Week 4 victory last year over the New York Jets. 58-yard catch and run for a touchdown. That was the longest play from scrimmage the Patriots had put out all season long. He finished with a career high in receiving yards in one game for 71. That allowed him to really showcase what he can do in the open field when he's used as a deep threat. But this is a guy that can also do work on the scene. You look at some of the uh, plays and some of the uh, the – some of what he helped the New England Patriots do to at least remain competitive in some of the games that they were in. Uh, I go back to their week seven win over the Buffalo Bills, 26 yard seam game to begin a touchdown drive. It doesn't always have to be the big play. He can be a facilitator as well. So whether you're talking about going vertical, going over the seam, or even making plays over the middle in the slot, Farrell Brown can do that. He's not going to be your everyday first option as a pass catcher at the tight end position. But like you said, Corbin, a solid complimentary piece to Noah Fant. And I think the, uh, the Seahawks are going to really see that sooner rather than later. Some of what this kid can do will pop in training camp. We've talked about the on-field contributions that Farrell Brown could make for this team. But before you and I had an opportunity to begin this segment, you immediately, the first thing you mentioned was how much Farrell Brown's leadership is going to be missed in the locker room. You had the opportunity to speak with him as a reporter covering the team. 
what is he going to bring? The Seahawks right now have a little bit of a void in the leadership standpoint because they've lost a lot of veterans. They've let go of players like Will Disley and Bobby Wagner's now in Washington. What kind of a locker room presence does Farrell Brown bring? And where do you see him helping the Seahawks with a new coaching staff being one of those veterans that is a galvanizing force in the locker room? Very good question. And right off the bat, he's going to bring an excitement and electricity to that locker room. He's just the type of guy that exudes it, whether it be through his confidence, quiet confidence. He's not overly confident. You won't find him to be obnoxiously confident. He's someone that is going to let his play do the talking on the field. But Farrow is also going to be the first to not only encourage his teammates, but he's going to let his abilities do the talking on the field. And I think that's what separates him uh, from maybe some of his peers in this um, in this realm, and especially at this position. He's always someone that's forthright. He's never going to be afraid to shy away from a bad play or things of that nature. He'll take ownership. He'll own up to it. But he's also going to let you know where he feels he can be best fit and best suited to help his team. And in terms of a character guy, you're really looking at someone with an extremely high character. Uh, any Patriot that I had the opportunity to speak with last year regarding Pharaoh Brown always was very complimentary to him in terms of his ability to be a teammate, his ability to be an ear to listen, and to lend a helping hand in terms of where players needed to be, especially some of the young receivers on that team really needed a little bit of leadership in that locker room. It was a flat, it was a fractured locker room last year under Bill Belichick, but Pharaoh showed up every single day and was a positive influence. And one of my favorite stories about his character is during Christmas time, where Farrell went into a local Brockton, Massachusetts area shop and paid off the layaway for all of the customers that were there, uh, really made helped make uh, a Merry Christmas for a lot of people in that area. And this is something where Farrow didn't do it for the fame. He didn't do it for the notoriety. He didn't notify the press he was going to do this beforehand. This actually broke two or three days after it happened. And... He just said, you know, this is a short, this is a store I used to shop at in my hometown. I wanted to go in. I wanted to make a difference. That's the type of leadership that you see from Pharaoh Brown. It's not going to be overt, but he's going to do it and he's going to do it under the radar, but it's going to speak volumes for the type of player and the type of man that he is. That to me is the type of guy that the Seattle Seahawks are going to get. I'm going to miss Pharaoh very much here in New England. Seahawks fans are going to gravitate to Farrow Brown being that kind of a player off the field and providing that kind of community service. Those type of players, especially when they're doing well on the field, which Brown certainly has a chance to do that in Seattle. Those are the kind of players that fans tend to flock to here in the Pacific Northwest. So really looking forward to the opportunity to cover Farrow, especially with all the kind things that you've said about being able to speak with him off the field. As always, Mike DeBate, greatly appreciate having you on Locked on Seahawks to break down the newest free agent tight end edition for the Seahawks. Absolutely, Corbin, and I thank you for having me on. And uh, I now pass the torch to you. You may now uh, use my catchphrase here in New England. Every time Farrow made a big play, I always finished it off with, so let it be written, so let it be done. If you want to go ahead and use that, I promise you there'll be no copyright infringement. Go ahead. Have at it, my friend. I think Seahawks fans may like that as well. I was waiting for us to go get Morgan Moses because they'd have a Moses and Abraham and a Pharaoh on the same team. <laughs> so you cannot when, ask for better I definitely will have to use your saying, and uh, I will make sure that it's not trademarked before I <laughs> to do that. Special thanks to Mike DeBay. When we return up next here on our Wednesday show, going to be diving into a revisit of the offensive depth chart, where things stand for the Seahawks after a week of free agency as we draw closer to the draft. You're listening to the Wednesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game for the NCAA tournament with March Madness officially underway. Whether you're betting on a big upset like a 16 seed such as Fairleigh Dickinson or a one seed, it's time to go dancing with America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Whether you think it's going to be a blue blood like Duke or a Cinderella such as Drake, all options are on the table and at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Wednesday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. 
A special thanks to Mike DeBate of Locked On Patriots for joining the show and giving some awesome insight on Farrah Brown. Our 12s out there, make sure that you are giving him a follow. M. DeBate NFL. He does a fantastic job covering the Patriots and NFL in general. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there as well. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Make sure to check out on Locked On's 24-7 streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today. For baseball fans, you better mark your calendars. In fact, it's coming up here shortly on the on March 20th today. We've got the MLB season preview exclusively on Locked On Sports today to get the insight from your local Locked On hosts on MLB season coming up here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Again, that's today. The show actually kicked off a little bit ago. Locked On Sports today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. So I made a little bit of a mess up at the end of that last segment because I said offensive, but we're actually going to be looking at defensive depth charts today because we already talked safeties early in the show. It was a perfect segue, and free agency is not over. We saw last year Mario Edwards signed in early May. Artie Burns came back late in free agency. So there will probably be a few more under-the-radar moves that happen to fill out the roster, but as far as significant moves, I'd be surprised if the Seahawks are going to do anything else here with all the signings they've made in the last several days, including getting Jonathan Hankins from the Cowboys, reuniting him with Adam Durde. So let's talk the defensive line here first, kind of a peek back at the depth chart now that we are done with free agency, at least the substantial part of it, Rob. And Hankins is the big addition to that defensive line that wasn't on the team last year, both figuratively and literally bringing him in to fill that void that you have to have at the nose tackle position. If you look at the players that thrived in Mike McDonald's scheme in Baltimore, he had some massive human beings up front and now they have one in Jonathan Hankins. To me, that makes this a more well-rounded defensive line going into this upcoming season. Yeah, 100% agree with you, Corbin. And we've talked about this so many times before. The Seahawks finished 31st in the NFL in touchdown, rushing touchdowns allowed. And that's exactly what big John Hankins is going to be able to help kind of, you know, just slam that gate in the middle um, to be able to uh, just allow Seattle's pass rushers uh, to be able to kind of get going off the edge. And while Jonathan Hankins is the big addition, I think that we have to start the conversation here with Leonard Williams because you know, I, I was nervous as a, from a Seattle perspective about whether the Seahawks were going to be able to get Leonard Williams to come back. This is not a terrific defensive tackle class when it comes to the draft. And we knew that there was going to be some splashy contracts that were that were given out there. And so to me, the addition of Jonathan Hankins and the retaining of Leonard Williams, I think really solidifies what was the biggest area of concern, in my opinion, for the Seahawks. I mean, you know, Jaron Reed played a terrific, had a terrific season last year, but you are counting on a guy who is, well, let's face it, a little bit older than ideally your best defensive lineman, at least most consistent defensive lineman would be. And now, again, like we talked about in the first segment there at the safety position, the Seahawks really do have a nice rotation as far as interior defensive linemen that I really think is going to make them much more formidable up front. Yeah, I think when you look at this line as a whole, I feel like this is a strong point on this football team, or it should be, because now you have fixed that hole where you didn't have a true nose tackle. And maybe Cameron Young can become that player in time. But he's still kind of light to do that at under 325 pounds. Jonathan Hankins, he is much bigger than that. So you have solved that problem. Being able to retain Leonard Williams with how well he played in the 10 games after being acquired from the Giants last year is a big deal. The other thing I like about Hankins coming in, though, this means that you're going to have Jaron Reed playing less snaps at the nose tackle spot, and he's going to be playing three tech and four eye most of the time, which is where I think he is most disruptive. He's around 300, 305 pounds. He has done okay at the nose spot, but still lighter than what you'd like to have at that position as a guy that's going to play a lot of snaps there. He can go there some when they're in passing downs, they may slide him down to the nose tackle spot and he can do some damage against guards and centers. But 
I like this addition from the sense that now you're going to really be able to maximize what Jaron Reed does best, and you're going to have Draymond Jones. And I would also mention the name Mike Morris. Mike Morris was having a really good training camp and preseason before he re-aggravated the shoulder injury that eventually needs surgery. He only played in one game, and I still remember a couple of the splashy plays that he made in that loss to the Rams in week one. And so it was disappointing we didn't get to see more of him. So that, to me, is kind of an under-the-radar player to keep an eye on, especially because, oh, by the way, he played for Mike McDonald at Michigan in 2021. So he's going to have that advantage. He's going to be back healthy after having that shoulder repaired. So I think Mike Morris is a name to keep a very close eye on that could potentially work his way into more snaps than you would expect in a defensive line rotation that I think is looking pretty good. Now, while the D-line has looked like it's been solidified, linebacker, I still feel like there's significant questions, at least the off-ball linebacker position. This group looks exactly the same as it did at the end of the season last year, the edge position, a healthy Uchenna Nuosu coming back, but you re-signed Daryl Taylor, Derek Hall, Boy Mafe are returning, Levi Bell's coming back, hoping to make this roster potentially. But the off-ball linebacker spot, you got two brand-new starters, and they're on one-year deals, and you don't necessarily know how they are going to fit in this Mike McDonald scheme to this point. I feel like I know exactly how they're going to fit into in the Mike McDonald's defense. I really like Terrell Dodson as far as being that that run plugger, that downhill kind of a guy. Um, and then Jerome Baker with his coverage ability, I really think that is where he is going to excel. So, Corbin, I mean, far be it for me to compare these two new additions to a future Hall of Famer and Bobby Wagner, a terrific football player, obviously a former first-round pick in Jordan Brooks. I think in some ways this might actually be an upgrade. I think that certainly it's going to be an upgrade in terms of the plays at or behind the line of scrimmage. I think Tyrell Dodson is going to be able to provide more plays, more tackles for loss than either. Bobby Wagner or Jordan Brooks were able to provide the Seahawks in the last couple of years. That's just the way that he plays the game. I mean, there's going to be some missed tackles. That is going to be one of the, uh, you know, one of the minuses that you are going to see from this new linebacker core. But you will see a different level of aggression um, that I think the Seahawks, frankly, have been missing for a while. And I also think that you're going to see more plays and coverage, especially from Baker. Um, and that I think is critical when you consider some of the tight ends and running backs that are you know playing in the NFC West. So I'm really excited about the inside linebacker uh, duo that Seattle brought in. And I love the fact that you did mention Uchenna Nuosu and Boye Mafia. I just think that you are going to see a return to the physicality that the Seahawks lost once Nuosu went down with the injury. And of course, I think that every Seahawk fan out there is excited to see what Boye Mafia and all the improvements that we saw in year two, what is he going to do with a defensive mind like Mike McDowell, who I think is really going to unleash him off the edge. So to me, and same thing with Daryl Taylor, really, because again, I, as I've said so many times before, I just really love his speed off the edge. I think that this is a positional group, Corbin. The Seahawks still could address. Wouldn't be surprised at all if they wind up taking at least one more linebacker when it comes to draft. But I already think that it has more upside to it than the linebacker crew that the Seahawks have tried out there on the field the last couple of years. Yeah, I think it's imperative that they have to draft a linebacker because both these veterans are on one-year deals. And mm -hmm. if they don't have phenomenal seasons, you know, maybe that makes it easier for you to resign them. But at the same time, if they both play well, you're probably not going to be able to afford to pay both of them. So they need to have somebody that's waiting in the wings. I still think that that is a position of priority going into the draft. And I think adding another edge could make some sense, especially if they could get their hands on a longer arm edge, like somebody like a Marshawn Nealon that's going to give you some of those Jadavian Clowney characteristics off the edge. They don't necessarily have that guy right now that could fill that spot in this defense. So if you're looking for a player like that, there are a few options in this draft, but I think these are both position groups the Seahawks at some point are going to address next month in the draft. Now, wrapping up real quick, we already talked safeties, but I think this is clearly a position group. We're going to have some question marks when you're looking at how the safeties are going to fit together. We are intrigued by the versatility, but we have to see how Mike McDonald and his coaching staff are going to use Julian Love, Sean Jenkins, and Kevon Wallace. I think all three of those players have a chance to play significant snaps in this defense. 
Corner's pretty set in stone with Reek Woolen, Devin Witherspoon. I think Mike Jackson's got a chance to play a lot of snaps if Witherspoon's going to be playing in the nickel for good chunks of the game. But then you look at the rest of the depth chart, and there's still some intriguing players. How's Jarek Reed the second going to look coming off a torn ACL? Where does Trey Brown fit into this equation in the final year of his contract? And Kobe Bryant, this might be the toughest player to figure out what they're going to do with him because there have been some murmurs out there that maybe the Seahawks would continue that transition with him to safety in the aftermath of the release of Diggs and Adams. And now that they've added Jenkins and Wallace, there's not really a spot for him at safety either. So he might be an odd man out that's just trying to battle for a roster spot on special teams at this point, which speaks to the depth that they have in the secondary. It does speak to the depth. It, it speaks to just the, uh, you know, the I don't know factor. I think that you have to acknowledge here. Look, again, I, I'm so excited about what Mike McDowell is going to bring to the front seven. But I think we also have to kind of kiss the ring a little bit. That is Pete Carroll and his expertise as far as a secondary guy. You know, we saw an unbelievable season from Devin Witherspoon this past season. We saw two years ago an unbelievable season from Tariq Woolen. Uh, But, of course, Tariq Woolen fell off off the map. Um, this past season, what's going to happen with Devin Witherspoon in year two? Are the expectations so high that he can't live up to them? Does Rick Woolen revert back to the stellar play that he saw during his first season in the NFL? That to me, I think that the secondary, there's a lot of Seahawks fans out there, Corbin. I think they feel like the secondary is Seattle's strength. To me, it is the biggest question mark on defense. I actually feel a lot better about the front, the, the linebackers as well as the defensive line than I do about the secondary, even though I would acknowledge that Seattle secondary is about as gifted as there is in all of the league. Yeah, it's all about talent, but are you going to get the production from that group? I'm confident Mike McDonald and his staff could do that, and I like it that Carl Scott is the one holdover from Pete Carroll's staff because he coached both Devin Witherspoon and Rick Will and the rest of these players that are returning and did a really good job. So I think that's going to help with that transition and Mike McDonald is going to be able to put some of his own seasoning on this defense to help the secondary players. But I do agree with you. There are some questions in terms of what that ceiling looks like. We think that there's an incredibly high ceiling for this group with some of the talent they have. But what is this new coaching staff going to be able to do in terms of getting them to that point this year? And how do the safeties fit in? We know what skill sets they have, but you've got some new players and you've got a new scheme. So there will be some growing pains that may neutralize a little bit the overall talent of that group. But I think in terms of personnel, the Seahawks have to be pretty excited about what they have at this point back there while also cutting costs at the safety position. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on a Thursday show, I will be riding solo and I'm going to be diving into the continued offensive line plan going cheap. Is this still the right way to go? Or Josh Schneider continuing to do things that didn't work before? I'm going to be diving into some eye-popping statistics and data, checking out the offensive line and where things stand, particularly in the interior. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for listening in and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Go Hawks.